Excellent. All right. We are up and running. Um, feel free to chime in if you're online, uh, by, but you do it by cancelling, by just speaking up. Cancel your microphone by hitting the space bar or whatever, because I can't actually see you at the moment. Um, uh, I can only see my screen. And, uh, and don't feel like you're going to interrupt. That's fine. Um, and if you're watching this on a recording, um, we've just watched the two Samuel, well, the, the Bible Project video, the second one on Samuel. Um, and the link should be in the email that I've sent you um, because I can't add that to the YouTube video. All right. So let's begin. Um, let me ask you, though, what is your... <coughs> What is your impression of um, King David? What what sort of things do you bring to the table when you when you think of King David? He's an amazing flawed character mm -hmm. that God uses. Um, there are times when you want to get really angry with him, mm -hmm. but then he reminds you of himself, of, of yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, and the burden of leading others is a difficult business. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He was uh, always sort of, you know, growing up, going to Sunday school touted as uh, the hero that every little boy wants ought to want to be like um until you read the second half of until you read you know chapter 11 and 12 um, and start to wonder oh is that what i want for my i mean apart from you know his uh exploits in um in uh, one samuel I mean, it begs the question, would anyone really want a position of serious leadership? Mm. Because the burden of responsibility weighs heavily. Mm. And for effectively a, a new, relatively new uh, kingdom, mm. uh, as a leader, he would have had targets all over him. Yep. He certainly had a king seeking to, to, to kill him. Yeah. Yep. And then he had a family. Mm. That um, were dysfunctional. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like people can view him quite simplistically, um, or we can view him through what we see, in, particularly in the second half of two Samuel, and realize the complexity of life. And I think that in the end, that enhances the way you read things like the Psalms as well, because you realize. Um, where a lot of this complexity is coming or where, where a lot of this, the complexity of the Psalms comes from. Um, but you also appreciate the way in which God can speak through a very flawed human being. Mm. So in some respect, it gives us a little bit of hope as well, that as flawed as David is and as flawed as we are, God may actually use us for his plans in some way. And it, it, that whole notion of, you know, David being tagged as a, as a man after God's own heart, mm. at times it's hard to sort of fathom. Yeah, and what does that phrase actually mean? That, yeah. You know, that David is a man after, after God's own heart, as in pursuing God's heart you know, under his own power or fashioned after God's heart, mm. as in God fashioned him around his own heart. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, we've looked at the Bible Project video. The um, 2 Samuel begins with those words, after the death of Saul there, um, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and stayed in Ziglag for two days. Um, and we see very quickly that the, there's an intention there to break up, a, a clear break with the last book, given that that's how Joshua begins, Judges begins. Uh, a new chapter, and we're going to focus, this one's going to focus exclusively on David um, and dedicate the whole of the book of 2 Samuel to his career instead of the the rise and fall of Saul and the 
slow rise of Dave, where David, where he was only a, a half half part character or a, a co star with that with Saul, if you could call it that. Um, so there, there's there's the sorts of things that you want to watch out for when you are you know looking at putting together a Bible study or stuff like that. Little markers like that that give you uh, an indication of what is in the mind of the writer that they're turning it over a new chapter or things like that. Um, the structure is a fairly simple one um, and uh, helps you see some important things. Uh, so David under blessing in that uh, first half of the book um, and what is often referred to as a bit of an apex in the book uh, is chapter 11 where this, uh, despite all of God's blessing, David falls into that heinous sin and then things seem to go uh, uh, somewhat downhill after that in 12 to 20 as David experiences the judgment of God for his sin and then as we saw in the video the epilogue which is uh, quite a um, uh, crafted piece of writing um, it's got a different shape to it which we'll look at later on um, so a few examples as we go um, so in chapter 2 verses verse uh, yeah, sorry, 2 Samuel 5, um, you see David taking up residence uh, in the city of David. Um, and uh, that's what um, he has called uh, Jerusalem, he's, and he's built up the area around it, um, and he's become more and more powerful because God is with him. That's kind of like a summary statement of why his rise is so successful, because the Lord Almighty was with him. Um, chapter 11, we've got this, his sin um, and uh, and the, the summary statement there, the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So despite God's blessing, he's done this thing and now he is under God's displeasure. Um, uh, and part of the pronouncement of that sin, which shapes the rest of, well, chapters 12 to 20, is that the sword will never depart from his house. Um because of the way in which uh, he has sinned. And um, and then we have the epilogue, which we'll look at a bit more later. Didn't have a summary for that one. Um, and that epilogue is not part of the chronological order of things. Um, as, as we saw in that video, it stands outside of the chronology. Um, and even the two, the beginning of chapter 21 and chapter 24, um, uh, are both from fairly early times, it seems. Uh, yeah. So let's um, break it up and look at chapters 1 to 10. We'll go through reasonably quickly. What I've tried to do is, is rather than say too many comments, is just show you a couple of, we'll look at a few example verses, but feel free to jump in with a comment or anything like that as we go. So David um, inaugurates his kingship, or he's inaugurated as king at Hebron, um, and uh, and that happens only uh, over that his his rule will only be over the towns and the tribe of, of Judah. So he asks God, will he go up to Judah? This is after his Saul has died. He's still in Ziklag, um, and the Lord tells him to go, uh, and uh, and there he is anointed um, as king over the house of Judah. So not the whole of Israel at first, just over the house of Judah. Um, but uh, you get a pretty early impression that David is the kind of man who will keep asking the Lord for uh, advice, well, or to, anyway. I mean, it's an interesting starting point, Sebron, because that's the area that was given to Caleb. Mm -hmm. And it's linked to the Anakites, mm -hmm. and they were seen as the big, mm. you know, the the big obstacle for Israel mm. uh, to get into the Promised Land. So I found that quite an interesting connection. Why did it start there? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that connection was kind of, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh. One of the one of the things we'll see is um, he's right fairly smack. Hebron's pretty much in the middle of Judah. Um, it's his, it's his stronghold. Um, it's where he has his most fans, I guess. Um, it's his safest place. 
Yeah. So it does have a, a quite a natural starting point for him. Um, it's where his allies are. Um, and he's been quite shrewd. So um, he's, he's, uh, he's the kind of person who, you know, um, blesses friends and punishes enemies, but blesses those who have been uh, sub friends to him in his time being pursued by Saul. Um, and he punishes those, not just who turn against him, but who have become an enemy to Israel. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what he's. That's what we reflected on last week. At the end, he's given those gifts to um, to those people, mainly around Judah, um, is where those gifts arrived. As the the surplus plunder of the Amalekites, and it highlights you know, God's faithfulness as He's turned weakness into a stronghold, which has led to the next phase of mm. Israel's mm. progress. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the there's a bit of I don't know if irony is the right word, but all the time the um, the Philistines thought that David was raiding Judah and the towns around Judah, and they, they even said that he, he's become detestable to them, um, which you know should be good for us. Um, but then it turns out no, he was actually raiding them and blessing Judah. So that's a good bit of irony in there. So David appears to be someone quite, he's got a bit of shrewdness, he's got a bit of political nous to it, but you don't probably need to be too sceptical as well. Like, he actually did love his people and care for Judah, um, and he's quite a diplomat, certainly quite a warrior, um, and part of that whole thing of um, wanting to see the Lord's people blessed. So he's fitting some of the, what we might call the ideal notions of a king. Early on, so it's good to have you know it's, it's reasonable to have hope for this king as opposed to Saul. Um, but there's trouble brewing in the in the north. Uh, Abner, who was the commander of Saul's army, takes Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, uh, takes him up to Mahanaim and made him king uh, over the the northern region. Um, and so there seems to be a bit of a potential conflict. Um, brewing and you see that go on for a few chapters but it doesn't last too long um, because you see the table turning pretty soon the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time but David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker um, and there's some good blood and guts and you know typical you know stuff you expect from the Old Testament uh, in there in those stories, until such time as um, Ishbosheth uh, is murdered, um, and uh, and then David is made king over all of Israel, um, and so I think everyone just gets a little bit sick of fighting, um, recognizes that there's no stopping David, um, and uh, and recognizes uh, God's anointing because, as they say, as these elders say. Um, you will shepherd, they they quote to him, the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. They've recognised not just David's strength as a king, but God's anointing of him as king. Um, and uh, and so then he rules over the whole of Israel. And there's a good summary statement there. Again, not 100% sure about the 40 years. Remember last week we were talking about 40 being uh, an era, more more likely an era necessarily than a specific number of years, 30, 40, 50, who knows how many. Uh, uh, and then David does something that is quite um, shrewd. Uh, he takes the, he takes Jerusalem, which was still under Jebusite control at that time, um, who were the part of the original inhabitants of the land. Um, they mock him. <laughs> you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can warn, ward you off. Um, and uh, matter-of-factly in verse 7, nevertheless, David captured the fortress, uh, the city of Zion, by apparently going up through the water duct. They didn't think to, uh, to block the water duct. 
But then why would you block the water duct? Because then you won't have any water. So, I remember reading um, about the water duct in Jerusalem um, when I was a very fresh Christian, and not that I'm a stale one now, but um, discovering a, yeah, a photo of that very water duct in uh, a Bible dictionary. Um, it's still there. Uh, and a friend of mine who's a lecturer at college um, visited that site and was uh, went into this water duct to have a look, um, only to be told to get out by um, Israeli soldiers pointing um, military rifles at him. <laughs> I'm coming out. <laughs> um, apparently he shouldn't have been in there. So, uh, and, and, uh, and he's Greek and looks very Greek or could easily be mistaken um, for any number of Mediterranean backgrounds. So he was rightly nervous. Um, so I'm thinking in our last course, on the photos I showed from Roy last week, but in, in an earlier course, mm. Roy's in Roy. Yes. In all those places. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, the interesting thing about David taking Jerusalem um, and moving uh, moving his capital to that place uh, is related to its location. So you can see on the map here, Hebron is right down there in the middle of Judah, uh, and Jerusalem is right up there on the border uh, between you know between Judah and, and Benjamin and the rest of the northern tribes. So it's quite a uh, central location. Uh, in terms of the spread of Israel, um, and much more palatable, perhaps, to the northern tribes as well uh, as a capital uh, than, than Hebron right there, deep down in the middle of Judah there. Um, and so uh, it provides him with, you know, a, a really good opportunity to just reduce those north-south tensions um, and and be perceived as, as a bit more of a neutral territory that everyone can have a, everyone can own, everyone can have Canberra a. Of it's the Canberra of Israel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's build a capital in a in a sheep paddock that nobody really wants to claim ownership for, and let's even um, the sheep. yeah, <laughs> even the sheep. Although I don't think he made it entirely out of prefab concrete. Um, that's a that's a slide dig at Canberra. Um, and I'm sorry if you are from Canberra and enjoy Canberra, but I couldn't help myself. My patience from this issue. Yeah, yeah. I'll cut that out of the recording later. Um, okay, so the rest, the other things going on in chapters 1 to 10, the buildings and the battles. So um, David's, you know, people are trying to capture favour with him. He's building a palace um, and... Uh, uh, and David is striking down the Philistines left and right. Um, so you can see again the rise, the, the blessing that's upon David uh, as the Lord is with him. Um, and that's only I just grabbed a few out of there. So, all oh, right, Glenn wants to join. Okay, I'll just make sure that uh, she's here. Hello, Glenn, if you can hear us. Glad that you could join. Um, and on, yeah, most likely. Let's make sure that we can see everyone. Oh. And uh, we're all there. Okay. I don't know how to see them all again because I've. Uh, ah, now I can see them all again. Uh, they're all there. Okay, they're still connecting, I think. Hopefully they'll get that sorted. It might look like that. They're connected. Oh, we're connecting to audio. Okay, give them one, what, two more seconds to connect. While they're connecting, there's one other critical feature about Jerusalem too. Mm -hmm. One other critical feature about Jerusalem? Plot of land that was given to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And and particularly with relation to I'll mention it next week. So as a teaser for next week. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll get there. 
I won't. I'll, I'll, if it's what I'm thinking of, I'll try not to spoil it. But who knows? <laughs> Coupon. All right. We'll press on. I think they're probably working out their sound issues as we go. Um, and like I said, you guys who are online, feel free to jump in at any point. Hopefully, um, uh, you are still able to hear and see, and everything's working. Okay. So, um, well. Oh, I'm on the right page. The religious reform. So, so David um, attempts to bring down the ark uh, from where it has been. Um, and uh, the first attempt turns out to be uh, a bit of a downer. Um, i just looked that up. Um, so in, uh, in chapter 6, in the wrong part. 2 Samuel 6. Well, firstly, let me ask, why would he want to bring the ark down? What are, what are some of the motives you would have as a king to bring the ark into your city? Because that's, that's um, God's, God's presence. And you, you, bring, you, bring, um, you want God's blessing? Yeah. Yeah, what would be what you would want God's blessing? What would be a more skeptical answer? What would what would be a more skeptical answer as to why you'd want to bring the Ark of the Lord into Jerusalem? Well, a huge damage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> David, you know, the person who brought the Ark in, so therefore, you know, there's. <clears throat> There's credibility for David, I suppose, mm -hmm. in the eyes of others. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I guess it's a bit of a sympathy act for David because I think his passion really is for God. Mm. And um, and he's really delighted in the fact that um, the Ark of the Covenant, which was the symbol, will be front and centre in the place where he is living. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The other... If you you could make the mistake, um, or you could make the mistake of thinking that the Ark of the Covenant was an idol, um, and that mistake has been made before. Um, so Hophni and Phineas tried to lead the, you know, carry the Ark out um, in uh, one Samuel four was it. They lost the ark, and uh, and God took care of it Himself, uh, and you know orchestrated the return of the ark Himself um, without anybody's assistance. In fact, with, with great disadvantage. Yeah, they basically yeah, please have it. Um, uh, but a skeptical person might suggest that yeah, you bring the ark in, you control the message, then you control the religious output. Of you know of Yah Yahwehism, um, and you control that to support yourself. Is this before when it gets, when it, is it all, Is this before it gets captured? Uh, no, no, this is well after. Well, because it was because captured before Saul's time. Before Saul's time, Maybe. it goes out. It goes out to these um, um, other cities. Yeah, it was captured and then returned while Samuel was a boy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the balancing act of all that, though, is, is David's understanding that the priestly role and the, the fact that uh, Nathan was mm -hmm. heavily aligned, mm -hmm. there was a due respect that David had for Nathan. Yeah. And so that, that's where I sort of think that that's the flaw in the argument that, you know, you, you've got control of God because you've got control of the ark. Mm -hmm. Because David understood that the priestly role was a significant role. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, he was submissive to that role. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the other the flip side is God's army was blessed. Yeah. And so there's, there's probably a sense that by David bringing it to Jerusalem, would be, Jerusalem would be blessing as well as a place of blessing. Yeah. Um, mm. So I, I think that's probably one of the strongest motivations um, mm. for it. 
So the blessing being an aspect of peace and rest. But uh, I think it goes back to the, the Avery promises too. Hmm. Yeah, David was very conscious of those. And um, yeah, and we're at a transition point. So Israel are no longer on the move. Um, they're in the land. They have a, a central capital now. Um, and so, you know, when Israel were camped in the desert, one of the things that they did was they camped around the ark. The ark was at the centre. The tabernacle was at the centre of the whole show. Um, and you can you can see a motive in, in that alone, that David wants to bring that to the centre and arrange Israel around that. That makes some some sense to it. But... For those who were sceptical, you would think, you know, ah, oh, that's just, you know, you can take that sceptical line, but then you do have trouble with the fact that it's his first attempt at bringing the ark in is, is well, it's it's a, it's fatal. Uh, for uh, Uzziah, Uzzah, who reaches out in uh, chapter 6, verse 6, uh, to, uh, to just stumble, to steady or take hold of the ark, um, and, uh, and he drops dead. Um, and David is, you know, quite understandably rocked by this and says, oh, I don't know if I should bring this in. This is too dangerous. Um, uh, and there's that until um, verse 12 there where David's told that the house where he had sent the ark to stay, <laughs> Obed-Edom, uh, who was probably saw it coming up the hill and went, oh, great. Um, well, his whole family is blessed. Uh, and so David... Uh, realizes that perhaps this this God will bless, uh, continue to bless, and so he brings it into Jerusalem, um, sacrificing a bull and a fattened calf every six steps. What what's a what's a picture you get of that? I don't want to be a fattened calf. I no, say, absolutely, um, I'll have it to <laughs> Yeah, but can you imagine the blood? The blood. The, so you, I, I guess you have this picture of a huge, you know, trail of blood following behind this ark, um, which suggests to you something, which is meant to obviously be a very vivid suggestion of the holiness and the, 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 the fear required um, to be in a in a relationship with this with this God, but it's also highlighting the fact that the significance of dealing with sin, because death, you know, mm. that blood that's spilt is obviously the, the repercussions of what took place. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's also signalling something else uh, in the way that David comes into Jerusalem, if you recall, he he comes in uh, dancing before the ark uh, and in his undies. Um, and uh, his wife, Saul's daughter, Michal, is not very happy. Um, perhaps she's got a different idea of what a king should be. He should not be this vulgar fellow who dances before the ark. He should be stately, like perhaps... He should be stately like my father would have been had had he not been killed. Who knows? Yeah, but she had a few other issues too, didn't she? The fact that she was taken from a previous husband. Yeah, anyway. And um yeah, stately father wants to kill the music players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nonetheless, it becomes that, you know, that's her exit stage left, really, from this story, and no contribution. Um, to to the life of Israel um, through the fact that she had no children, um, which is you know, and it, I, I guess is a tragedy in Old Testament Israel to not have children. There's, there's never, you know, it's always you know a tragic story um, that where we where we find you know those who are without children are blessed with children, um, but those who are just left without children are in the eyes of the Old Testament, it's a clear tragedy um, uh, because of the shape of the Old Testament, because of the way in which people would have, were meant to contribute uh, to the plan of God through Israel. Um, 
So, yeah, kind of closing the book on Saul there, but then uh, opening the book uh, on a whole new thing with the, um, where are we? the Davidic covenant of 2 Samuel 7. Um, so this is where David is uh, he's quite happy. Um, he's got rest from his enemies uh, and then he gets an idea. Here I am living in the palace of Cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Um, and Nathan replies, as, you know, those who hang around kings often do reply, sure, go for it. Whatever you have in mind, go ahead, do it. The Lord is with you. Um, what do you think of that Nathan's initial response? Like, would you have said the same thing? Well, it's, it, I mean, it's hard. I don't know. In those words there, it's hard to actually work out whether, as you say, Nathan's not going to get in the way of uh, David's decision making mm. or it's acknowledgement. That's what as he says in the last few things, the Lord is with you. Mm. There's nothing that's, you know, theologically unsound here. Um, mm. God will bless and we won't bless. <laughs> mm. I, think, I think verse 4 says it all. Verse 4? Mm. Oh, sorry. About that night the word of the Lord came to him. <laughs> As in the word of the Lord hadn't, he hadn't inquired of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like Nathan, perhaps he, it sounds reasonable, perhaps he jumps the gun a little. Um, and this is a, probably a, a quick reminder to Nathan of what his role is. It's not necessarily to speak his own mind, to speak the mind of the Lord. Um, but as we said before, if you had that sceptical mind and thought, you know, this is just another, this is an attempt of the king to uh, manipulate the, the religion of the day, the religion of the people, Yahweh, Yahwism, around his, his purposes and to legitimize himself. Uh, you, you, you might go, hey, Nathan's playing into that to some extent. Um, but it's very quickly corrected. Uh, so what we're going to do is read the rest of verse um, of chapter uh, 7, well, at least on to verse 17. Um, and what I want us to do as we do that is list off the, um, the promises that uh, are made there um, and you know what you can see in those promises. So does someone want to read, um, we'll read on from verse 4 through to verse 17 for us? Verse 4 to 7. Yep. As I read, I read, I read, I read yep, yep, from verse 4 through to verse 17. Yep. That night, the word of the Lord came to Matthew, saying, Go and tell my servant, this is what the Lord said. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought Israel, Israel out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place, with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Is 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 Israel Is Israelites, I have ever said to any of these women who my command shepherd my people to Israel, why have you not built me a house? I'll tell you. Now then, tell my servant that this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from ashes and from following, from following the flocks to be rules over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from all you. Now I make your name great, right, like the name of the greatest men. Of the earth. As I will provide a place for my people, Israel, and will plan them so they can, so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be dispersed. Wicked people will not oppress them any more as they did at the beginning. And I have done ever since the, the time I appointed leaders over my people, Israel. I will also give you rest and all my of all your enemies. The Lord declared to you that the Lord of the Lord will establish the nation of Israel. When 
Thanks, Luke. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, number of promises. What do you see in there? Feel free to chime in if you're online too. His promise is these these um, children are going to live forever. Yeah. So do you mean that they will live forever, or that someone will live forever? Well, some he says that um, <coughs> he'll make his name great. Mm hmm. Um, and I like the name of the greatest of earth. Yeah. Have you heard that before? Abraham. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, there's a there's elements of this that are a restatement of the Abrahamic promise. Provide a place for his people. Yeah. Israel. So that's a, again straight out of the Abrahamic promise book or Genesis, otherwise known as. Also, the rest. Yep. Again. Yep. Similar to what we've heard from Abraham. Yep. Yep. But there's new aspects to it as well. What do you see is new? Um, well, he talks about raising up an offspring mm. to succeed mm -hmm. and establishing his kingdom. Mm. The emphasis on kingship, maybe. Yeah, yeah. There is an emphasis on on a yeah on kingship, um, which wasn't which was kind of you know hinted at in the Abrahamic promise. I think to, I can't remember where, but to Abraham, God said, "Kings will come from you," uh, but it certainly wasn't the focus. Or here forever. That's a promise. Yeah. Yeah, so the, an, an eternal dynasty. But there's there's a there's a relational sort of difference from here on. It's not just a king that I will choose, but in verse 14, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me, which becomes a very important aspect of for, for the expectations of Israel. Um, they are looking for someone um, who is a son of God. I mean, it's a it's a harsh call because he says, "When he does wrong, I will punish him with rod." Well, his son didn't. Yeah, but those who were considered his sons yeah. did. Those kings of Israel, like you know Solomon, uh, David, they were punished. I think the the um, the the when when he does wrong is not um, is contingent on the person doing wrong. It's not that he that they all will do wrong. As in, we shouldn't expect that because Jesus is perfect, he can't be the Son of God. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's going to take that's going to really shape the expectations um, of Israel from here on um, and establish this line through David as well. I mean, I guess the other point that it says, you know, in, in, I think it's a verse on that, it says, uh, the Lord himself to establish a house. So it's actually, it 
the law is doing. It's not, we can look at that as an image, mm. but it's, that that's the law's orchestrating. Mm. Yeah. And um, as we'll see uh, in the end, Nathan is certainly no um, pushover. Mm. Um, it's not as though Nathan is gifting him the, uh, against the island. Um, and uh, he's a bringer of bad news as well. It's good. All right. We'll keep going then, unless anyone's got a question or a comment or wants to add anything there. Feel free to jump in any time. Probably one question I have, is this the high point by David? I mean, we talk about the high point of Solomon being, you know, the, effectively the consecration of temple type activities. Mm. Um, is this potentially the high point for David? Because it's not long before we then start getting into his downfall. Mm. We start to, uh, yeah, I mean, in, in as much as you uh, see the, um, that there's, there's still obviously work for David to do, but he's got the ultimate sort of legitimization um, and hope for the future. So even though there are still enemies to be defeated and battles to be had, you go in with the supreme confidence that, you know, this is not going to end badly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's the setting for the high point. I mean, and and given that the way we look at Solomon as you know the that God blessing the temple that he built um, by his presence, um, uh, and it's those chapters that and that and the chapters around it focused on how they those promises for Abraham had um, begun to be fulfilled and, and seen as fulfilled. Um, it's got that link to the you know, where the, the covenant is expressly fulfilled, um, yeah, it's going to be seen as a high point in the whole narrative. Yeah. But, um, but in terms of a turning point in the narrative of 2 Samuel, it's not a turning point. Um, things keep going in the same general direction um, uh, until, we, until we get to chapter 11. Um, but, and that, the, there's an example there, David reigns over all Israel. He does what is just and right for all his people in uh, in chapter 8. Uh, and then he's consolidating and bringing everything together. There's starting to be uh, the clear order of an established kingship um, as, you know, there, there's a, and there's a summary of all the different people um, and their roles and as uh, in, in looking after the various aspects of managing a nation. Things are settled and good. Kind of reconciliation with uh, Saul's family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's reconciliation with through Mephibosheth. You get a picture of David's faithfulness there as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's everything's going well until chapter eleven um, and twelve. So, uh, chapter eleven, obviously, we we get to David's adultery uh, with Bathsheba uh, and uh, and then David's attempt at covering it up through um, through his plotting um, and uh, it's in it, we, we won't do it today but chapter 11 is a very interesting study and maybe maybe if you if you in for the long haul today and you stick around for uh, uh, Simon Gillum's thing at, at 3 p.m. Um, he'll probably bring this up. Is it, chapter 11 is an amazing study on sin um, in the way in which we, you know, David does various attempts to um, either uh, to, to cover it up. Um, you know, there's, there's about three attempts to cover it up until he finally uh, does away with Uriah. Um, and seeks to even cover that up. Um, and you know, you you the, the longer you look at chapter eleven, the more you start to see the way in which we will try to avoid sin, avoid the consequences of our own sin as well. Can I just say, they, um, uh, Don Carson gave a talk on the Easter year and talked about that. Mm. And, and we often focus on the you know the, the arrival of the 
sort of stuff. He focused a lot of talk on the beginning before he even got to that stage, mm. the point where he was looking and then covering and whatever. Yeah. And that's the bit we really need to focus on because God's word in Corinthians 10 13 is God walked right, right. David had lots of opportunities to stop yeah. at any point along that way. Yeah. He wasn't a hapless victim in all of this. Oh, no. no. Well, I mean, chapter 11 starts off, you know, <clears throat> in the spring at the time when kings go off to war. I mean, that is such a. <laughs> yeah. What's those his point, king? Those points have gone made. Yeah. Yeah. Just All the other kings would go to fight. He wasn't 70. Mm. Uh, he was still a young king. Mm. Yeah. I just have a roster day, a roster war off. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, idle hands of the devil's workshop. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's read chapter 12 then um, and uh, and try to get a picture of judgment and forgiveness. Um, uh, it's a slightly longer chapter. Um, who wants to read chapter 12? Those online. Yeah, or... Feel free to read it if you're online. Do we have any takers? Um, John, Helen. I'll do it. All right, John's going to read it for us. Thanks, John. So the whole of chapter 12, Dave, you want? Yeah? Yep. Let's go. Yep. Okay. The Lord sent Nathan the prophet to David, and when he entered the king's presence, he said, In a certain town there lived two men, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had large flocks and herds, the poor man had nothing of his own except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He reared it, and it grew up in his home together with his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and nestled in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. One day a traveller came to the rich man's house, and he too meant to take something from his own flock or herd to serve to his guest, took the poor man's lamb and served that up. David was very angry and burst out, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He shall pay for the lamb four times over, because he has done this and shown no pity. Nathan said to David, drum roll, thou art the man. Mm -hmm. This is the word of the Lord, the, the God of Israel to you. I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's daughter and his wives to be your own. I gave you the daughters of Israel and Judah. And had this not been enough, I would have added other favours as well. Why then have you flouted the Lord's word by doing what was wrong in my eyes? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, the man himself you murdered by the sword of the Ammonites, and you have stolen his wife. Now, therefore, since you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife, your family will never again have rest from the sword. This is the word of the Lord. I shall bring trouble on you from within your own family. I shall take your wives and give them to another man before your eyes, and he will lie with them in broad daylight. What you did was done in secret, but I shall do this in broad daylight for all Israel to see. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan answered, the Lord has laid on another the consequences of your sin. You will not die. But since by this deed you have shown your contempt for the Lord, the child who will be born to you shall die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the boy whom Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became very ill. David prayed to God for the child and fasted and went in and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The older men of his household tried to get him to rise, but he refused and would eat no food with them. On the seventh day, the child died and David's servants were afraid to tell him. While the boy was alive, they said, we spoke to him and he did not listen to us. How can we now tell him that the boy is dead? He may do something desperate. David saw his servants whispering amongst themselves and realized that the boy was dead. He asked, is the child dead? And they answered, yes, he is dead. David then rose from the ground, bathed and anointed himself and put on fresh clothes. He entered the house of the Lord and prostrated himself there. Afterwards, he returned home. He ordered food to be bought and when it was set before him, ate it. His servants asked him, what is this? While the boy lived, you fasted and wept for him. But now that he is dead, you rise and eat. While the boy was alive, he answered, I fasted and wept, thinking it may be that the Lord will be gracious to me and that the boy will live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. He will not come back to me. David consoled Bathsheba, his wife, 
He went to her and had intercourse with her, and she gave birth to a son and called him Solomon. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet that for the Lord's sake he should be given the name Jedidiah. Joab attacked the Ammonite city of Rahab and took the king's pool. He sent this report to David. I attacked Rabah and uh, taken the pool. Now muster, muster the rest of the army, besiege the city and take it. Otherwise, I myself shall take the city and the name to be proclaimed over it will be mine. David accordingly mustered his whole force, marched on Rabah and attacked and captured it. The crown, which weighed a talent of gold and was set with a precious stone, was taken from the head of Milcom and placed on David's head. David also removed a vast quantity of booty from the city. He brought out its inhabitants and set them to work with saws and other iron tools, sharp and toothed, and made them labor at the brick kilns. David did this to all the Ammonite towns. Then he and his army returned to Jerusalem. All right, thanks, John. It's um. So what do you, what do you see there in uh, judgment and forgiveness? What pops out at you? A few things that pop out. Well, judgment obviously um, not only David, but it's the uh, you know the physical death of his uh, son, mm. the pain and the grief that goes with that. Mm. Um, and there's no typically easy explanation for that. I've heard lots of people give partial explanations, but uh, it doesn't seem to remove the difficulty. And I, I'm not sure that we ought to try to remove the difficulty. Mm. Mm. Um, the the second, the second child. Yep. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You want to. You want to be. I mean, pastorally, you always want to be careful with this section because you know these people have lost children. Um, but there is there is pastoral hope in there in what David says um, in uh, at the half or verse um, where is it verse twenty three um, where he says uh, can I bring him back again I will go to him I'll go to him but he will never return to me um, it's only a small hint but it's a hint at um, at something uh, worth putting out hope. It's interesting, though, that David <clears throat> had poured out his heart to God in the hope that God would change his mm. um, decision. <clears throat> so yeah. uh, how do we reconcile that? Yeah. it's It appears that there's nothing that God owes David. I mean, what did God owe David through his sin? What would have been just for God to do? <clears throat> as king, an extra responsibility mm. to take the king. So you almost think that uh, death would have been not inappropriate. Oh, death is him. death is something prescribed mm. in the law, mm. and he's not above the law, mm. as as was made clear um, to Samuel. I mean, um, through Samuel to Saul. David understood as well. And so, I mean, you at least should expect some sort of severe discipline, which he gets. I mean, the silent issue on this is the fact that um, David's focus is on the sin that he's committed towards God, but he's actually committed sin towards others. Mm -hmm. I know that Psalm 51, he talks about the same thing as you know, that I've sinned. Mm -hmm. Because I'll, that's what he sees all eternity. Yep. But it is an interesting conundrum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the death of the child sort of fits into that conundrum. Yeah. That the consequences emanate out towards everyone around him. Mm -hmm. yep. His army. His army, yep. Um, and even the, the point that he's told quite clearly that God himself will raise up 
you know, those with evil intent against him. Um, and those sorts of things, you know, that he describes do happen. Hmm. I think the disturbing thing here is the, the instrumentalizing of the son, right? The, the yeah. that, that for David's sin, the son has to die. Now, hmm. That's pretty disturbing. Yeah, yeah. It, is it raises all kinds of questions about the, you know, where responsibility lies. And... Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think it's, it's something that is always there. Um, it's something that is always in the scriptures. Like lots of people throughout the scriptures and just in general history and our observation of life, lots of people die because of the the sins and the evil and the misdeeds of other people. This one is um, one where we get the insight uh, of God's specific um, inter intervention, I guess you call it, or interaction. Um, but we forget that God is sovereign over all things as well. Um, we just see this in more finer detail with all the relational, um, you know, uh, connections on display, but it, yeah, it's it's very disturbing. Um, he doesn't have. I mean, it's interesting. He's now got two wives that really don't have a happy hmm. entrance into a relationship. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And yet, at the same time, verse fourteen. Um, the Lord has removed the verse 14. Uh, the Lord has taken away your sin, you will not die. And yet the, the punishment or the consequences, the discipline uh, remains. Mm. I'm just thinking back. I'm just thinking back to Acts. There's, there's, they're using a different they're, they're using the psalm mm. out in Acts two. Mm. There's a, there's a, one second. That it, yeah. yeah that was, so in Peter in Acts two says um, David died. Oh, yeah, but, but he lives on. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, although I, I expect that David still expected that he would die, just not as a direct consequence of this particular sin. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The um, sorry, the sorry, the parallel. David's grief for the loss of the young child mm -hmm. is that mirrored then when he loses his late, his older child or son, I should say, mm. um, many chapters later, mm. who's trying to basically oust him and he gets killed and he mourns over that death. Mm. And it, well, you start to see David become quite captured by his family relationships um, in a way that uh, renders him rather impotent to act, which we see in the very next chapter, actually. Um, but it is, it is evident that this is, this is a, a remarkably honest account of David's life. If you're the victor writing about the king, you don't write these sorts of things. Um, well, you certainly, and, 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 you know, you... You might even, if you do write about them, you try to justify them. Um, this is not the, this is not just simply the the annals of the victorious king. Uh, okay. so, so, knowing that David had the Holy Spirit with him, mm -hmm. where did the Holy Spirit go? Can I ask that question? You could ask that question. You could ask it of um, what happened to. So long as you ask next week of, of David Thompson, what happened to um, the Holy Spirit with Solomon and all his wisdom? 
um, what was going on there. Uh, that's a, that's a that's a conundrum as well, isn't it? But that's a conundrum that we still deal with because um, you know you and I still sin. We still need to. Say, the answer was last week. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It's about passing the buck. It's David's response. It's all these Davids that have all these answers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's a fairly very early technique. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, the Holy Spirit enables us to serve and enables and confirms our relationship. It's a seal of our relationship with God. But the Holy Spirit is not God's remote control. He's not the uh, bigger obstacle that we're solving. Mm. Mm. When's the talk in the uh, Creed series on the Holy Spirit? Is that coming? Um, not next week, I think. In a few yeah, weeks. So yeah. yeah, that, that's probably where I'd be putting the thing about what's wrong with Holy Spirit is. Yeah. Uh, we get to ask questions during the sermon. You still can. Sure. You think you're going to answer. No, that's a big The Holy Spirit is the new. I don't think it's very good. He's very active at the moment, which is what I'm angling for. All right. Let's, um, let's keep moving. Um, so the turmoil begins um, right in chapter 13 as we move into that. Now we've, we've gone over the apex of, of chapter 11 and 12 and things start going down in a way. Um, and what we'll see in the rest of it is, is in 13 to 20 is coloured by God's uh, judgment and the consequences of David's sin. So I just wanted to use it, this section. So we, we saw in the video what happens, we, we, we're vaguely familiar, what happens in chapter 13 is a horrible, horrible story. Um, it interestingly mirrors um, a lot of what happens in, in this sort of crime, in this sort of abuse uh, today as well. There's lots of stuff in there that you can draw out of that chapter. Um, as despicable as Amnon is, uh, so also is Amnon's um, friend. Um, and I uh, can't find his name again. Um, who gives him the advice, Jonadab, uh, another despicable character who, who was certainly no real friend. Um, cousin. cousin. Mm. And, um, but... Out, the, the, the outrage of the event is only exacerbated by what happens afterwards. So verse 21, King David heard all this. And what did he do? Well, he got shirty. And, uh, but nothing else. Um, and no one, Absalom never said a word to Amnon, um, either good or bad, so it's left a little bit ambiguous. Um Yet we see his heart. He hated Amnon um, because of his grace. And then verse 23, before anything happens, and this time it, it happens by Absalom's initiative, two years later. So it's not as though Absalom jumped in to fix his situation straight away. He gave his dad two years to do something. Now, I can imagine why David was so inept in this. Did he not see his own self in what happened? You know, Amnon saw what he wanted and took it. David did exactly the same thing. Um, it results in a murder, um, which is also what happened. So both David's sons combine to basically echo what David himself did. Um, so there's kind of a, there's a, there's a like father, like sons thing going on there. Um, all right. But also then in the rest of these chapters, we see David turning to others uh, for wisdom. Um, and, uh, and there's an example of that through uh, uh, Hushai, um, who becomes the, um, the alternate advisor in the wake of David's uh, uh, exile as he escapes the rebellion of Absalom. Um, Hushai stays behind um, 
and uh, gives alternative advice to a Hefafel. Um, it's a difficult one to say. Um, and so he is basically planted there as a um, as a spy, um, but also to confuse and give the wrong advice or alternate advice to Absalom. Uh, and there are a number of them. Others is the um, the wise woman of Tekoa. Um, there's Joab's interventions uh, and, and those who uh, surrounded David, basically keeping him alive through a lot of this. Um, Joab has to step in uh, and fix the situation um, in the in the midst of David's, um, I guess, uh, in inept attempts at controlling Absalom or responding to what Absalom is doing. Um, and it is tragic, but nonetheless, it has to. His kingship was under great threat. Um, and so, but it's also, I guess, uh, heading towards what we'll see with uh, the, the wisdom aspect of um, Israel's nationhood and the way in which kings operate and, and the, the role that wisdom plays in the life of, of Israel, starting to, to rise up here uh, as early as David's kingship. Um, the other part of it is uh, the succession narratives now it's, uh, bleeding into uh, uh, one kings in this section, um, but it's a process that you see rolling out across chapters nine to twenty, and um, and also um, yeah, one kings uh, one and two is this um, uh, process where there's a progressive elimination. Um, of all those who may take the, who could possibly take the throne um, after David, Amnon, Absalom, Adonijah uh, is is eventually done away with under Solomon, um, and uh, and Solomon finally emerges as the um, as the one who will take the kingship, um, and uh, and so we see we see that there uh, where Solomon is. Uh, proclaim the king. Um, the ground shakes as everyone rejoices. Um, and if you read on from there, that's when uh, uh, Adonijah gets a message that uh, he better hot footed out of there and stop pretending to uh, be able to take the throne. So the tension is, is still there. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, to sum up those, that section, I think we can see pretty clearly it's not an apology for the Davidic kingship. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a, it's not defending David in any particular way. Um, it's certainly uh, if you if you did have that skeptical mind watching him bring in the ark, uh, trying to process the promises of of, of chapter seven, um, it's done away with later on because of all the, all that else is recorded of David. What you do see. Um, is that David's leadership survived despite the best efforts of David sometimes. Um, and God places around him people like Joab, Hushai, the woman of Abel, Beth, and Maka, um, in chapter 20 there, to, to try to um, <laughs> stop him from, from throwing it all away. Uh, and Nathan especially plays a very decisive role. Um, obviously, in chapter 7, endorsing the, the rule and, I guess, promoting David to that role of a king that from which all the other kings will come from. Um, but he's right in there with Solomon as well um, and one of the chief people who intervenes to stop uh, Adonijah taking that kingship before Solomon can be proclaimed king uh, as well. So he's there working with Bathsheba, uh, working with David, trying to um, make sure and hold on to this. It must have been a very stressful time for Nathan as well, given that he knew of what God had promised. Um, and then finally we get to the epilogue. Uh, and as we were saying before, it's quite a structured piece of writing. Um, and this, this, uh, there's a similar uh, outline of this in the, um, in the booklets, but this one's actually taken from um, uh, John Woodhouse's commentary he also recognizes that, that, um, yeah, it's thematically arranged, um, and uh, 
yeah, we see the way in which I guess we see the shape of David's whole kingship. There's there's, there's problems, um, but uh, and there are strengths, uh, but right at the centre of it, uh, there is hope, and the hope is based on the promise of the Lord. Um, and so it's probably a helpful thing to to go back over that that epilogue and, and see how that shape uh, is there. Um, and uh, just as a, a very brief example, um, the beginning and the end. So this is um, uh, in the first instance in chapter 21, right at the beginning of this epilogue, um, you've got, um, all right, thanks, Helen. She's to send a message that she needs to leave. Um, they uh, got answers. So this is after the the, the very another very difficult episode in uh, chapter 21 of the the um, God's curse upon the land because of the sin of Saul against the Gibeonites. Um, but when God answers a prayer, uh, the land is relieved. Uh, and then again, um, that uh, at the end, God answers the prayer on behalf of the land uh, in chapter 24. Uh, Right. So the big question, the overall theme of 2 Samuel, what do you think of the big question? How do you have a dynastic ruler and prophetic leadership? Only if God's in control. Mm -hmm. Only if God's in control. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that dynasty is not upheld by the strength of the dynasty, which is a mistake that, we see that even more next week. Yes, we'll see that even more next week. Yeah. And uh, and so the, the you know the big question will, will always be over the over the king is 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 he listening to the word of the prophets, um, which you might pick up is one of the key criticisms that Jesus makes of the the Jews in general is that they didn't listen to the prophets. In fact, they put them to death, and now they are seeking to put him to death. Uh, and so it, it comes down to a um, a pastoral question for every Christian leader as well, um, as was helpfully pointed out today by um, Simon Gillen. He said, you know, you need to pray for me to not get distracted uh, and to remember to be to remember Jesus. Uh, sounds like a weird thing to say to someone working in a theological college. But um, there where you are you're, you're leading leaders and trying to train leaders, Still, the first thing that you need to remember is to is to not get distracted and remember Jesus to keep listening to Him. Um, so the message isn't changing; it's just that we're not hearing it all the time. Mm. So like Ravi Zacharias. Mm. Ravi Zacharias, yes. Multitudes. Yeah, yeah. The 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 there was quite a list in the last twelve to. 24 months, wasn't it, of, uh, of Christian leaders who had apparently seemingly forgotten Jesus, uh, which, I mean, we do. We all do to certain degrees because what is sin apart from, you know, forgetting the Lord, um, which is what David seems to have done, you know, that night looking over Bathsheba and then continually kept forgetting and trying to cover it up. Yeah. Um, do you think David was judged less severely than Saul? Even though he's, he's, he's I mean, are we, are we saying that God's disproportionate? Is that what you're inferring with that? 
Yeah, or the, oh, just the Court of Justice, I think the issue there is they repent it. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Mm -hmm. I mean, take the thief on the cross. Yeah. Next to Jesus. Yeah. Don't really know what he did. A thief, but I could have done a stack of other things too. Mm. But there's the difference. Yeah. Yep. That's right. So the it, it gives you another insight into what <laughs> perhaps we might have meant before, as David as a man after God's own heart. Um another another angle to that is not simply it doesn't simply mean that he has the perfect heart, um, but that his heart uh, resonates with the Lord in that way. I always remember this the, the time. Um, we were having a baptism planned for the following week. A number of teenagers from our evening congregation in Gunnedah were to be baptised, and one of them came to me and said, I can't do it. I, I don't think I should be baptised. And I said, well, why not? Said, well, because I can't do it. I can't live this Christian life. I keep stuffing up. I keep sinning. And I don't think I'll ever get it right. And I said... I know, that's why you're getting baptised, <laughs> because you actually do get it. You recognise that. You recognise your inability to get this right, and that is why we come to Jesus, and that is what we are recognising in this baptism. Uh, you are closer than you think. You, 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 you've got it. You've, you're grasping it. You just need to receive it. This grace and forgiveness, and stop thinking that you've got to make it. And I think that's that is one of the key differences between David and, and Solomon. He recognized not his own strength, he recognized uh, his God's mercy upon him, which is all we can do. Mm -hmm. Well, tied off there, and, um, uh, and Mr. Thompson will pick it up next week and take us through the kings. Well, no, at least Solomon, just, just Solomon next week. Just Solomon just next Solomon. week. All right. How about, I, um, how about I pray for us? And we'll, uh, we'll tidy it up. Uh, Father God, thanks so much for uh, the way in which we see uh, so much of ourselves in David. And yet, we see so much of your mercy, um, even amidst your even amidst judgment. We see your your discipline, um, which does not in any way hold back your love. Uh, and Lord, we are also recipients of your love and mercy, uh, and occasionally your discipline. Uh, and we know through those things that we are indeed loved, and that you do treat us as sons and daughters. Uh, and we are so privileged to receive that. Lord, we pray that, uh, as we have reflected, we would um, have hearts that, uh, that are fashioned after yours and that um, we reach out and cry out to you for mercy, uh, that we recognise our sin and our inability to please you of our, on our own strength and that we draw on you by your spirit, uh, we draw on you by your word and we draw on you uh, by the people you place around us from that are also that also belong to you uh, and uh, Lord we pray that uh, you will strengthen us uh, to serve you and love you uh, and indeed uh, in the complexities of this life uh, to stick with you as we know that you stick with us and uh, we thank you for our time and pray these things in Jesus name Amen. Amen. all right thank you